Well, welcome to Grace Bible Fellowship, where we read the scriptures verse at a time, book at a time, and we, we're going through the book of Genesis, because we know that the scripture says that everything has been written four times for our learning. And so I understand and you understand that God has put his will down in pen in this book we call the Bible. We understand that it was the holy men of God were moved along as they were led by the Holy Spirit to write it. And so more than just a simple narrative or a bedtime story, we've got God trying to communicate and teach us something because everything that's been written is for our learning. Even those big long passages with all those names, <laughs> God has written all those things in there for our learning. And so I like to learn. But what I'd like to do better is actually do everything I know and remember everything I learned. So that's why I put funny pictures up on the screen. I'm hoping it, it sinks into your brain somewhere in a, in a nice place. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you have gathered us in this place in the safety and the confines of this building. Thank you that you have called us as your people, the church, to be here. And Lord, I don't know necessarily what you have planned for each one of us, but you do. And I know that you want to speak to us, Lord, and make us more like yourself. There are things you want to remove from our lives. There are things that you want us to see so that we don't repeat the mistakes of the past, both in our lives and also in the folks that we're going to read about. So Lord, I pray that you'd help us with our mind and our heart that we would submit our heart to you, that we would be willing to be who you want us to be, that our mind might retain it. We pray that you help us now, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. In case I didn't mention it, you could turn your phones off. It's okay. Hey, it happens at men's breakfast. And I find there are some people that are more adept at technology than others. So, you know, they thought they hit that little button, but their very large fingers are finding it hard to discern whether the little button got turned off or not. So we're going to be in the book of Genesis. We're looking at the life of Jacob. Jacob, who we saw last week, got a new name. God gave him a new name. He asked him what his name was. He said, it's Jacob, which means heel catcher or one who trips people up. And so he says, well, your name is no longer Jacob. And the blessing that he was given was that his name is now Israel, which means to be governed by God, which is a pretty cool name. I mean, if your name's Jacob, I'm really sorry. <laughs> but God named him for a reason. And it's interesting, one of these little, I'm going to start off with a tidbit. This is one of the times where God renames somebody and it really doesn't stick. It's actually a three to one ratio where he's called Jacob instead of Israel. You know, you see Abram, who's called Abraham. And it, from then on, he's known as Abraham. You see Sarai, who was renamed Sarah. And from then on, she was Sarah. Jacob is named Jacob. He's given a new name. And he's finding it really hard to fit into the coat. He's finding it hard to get Israel governed by God on. Maybe you know what I'm talking about. It's a difficult thing to be born a Jacob and then be called by God to be an Israel. Maybe you have an understanding of what that's like. What it is to be called out of the world, to be called from a natural state into a spiritual state, to be born again by the Spirit of God through the life and blood of Jesus Christ, that we now take on a new name, don't we? Amen. And so there are things that we can learn from the parallels here in these stories. Well, getting into our story, just to remind you where you are, there are reasons I do that, but I forget. Recently, we've been in Genesis looking at the life of Jacob. We saw that he spent a long time with a man named Laban, his father-in-law, and he bargained to work for a wife for seven years. And then he woke up on his honeymoon morning and it wasn't the woman that he paid for. 
with his seven years of labor. And so he got tricked into the firstborn scenario, which he knows full well because he was a swindler with his father with the firstborn, wasn't he? And so God is trying to escape all these things out of his life, cook them off through trial, difficulty, and being exposed to somebody who's even greater of a, a, a tactician or a deceiver than himself. And so he has to work another seven years for Rachel, and then they had the whole competition of who could have more children. Doesn't that sound like an interesting Olympic event? <laughs> so finally, after 20 years of being with Laban, he says, listen, I've had enough. I'm getting out of here, and he leaves. And so he goes. And of course, he does this secretively, and Laban catches up with him and says, what are you doing? You're taking my daughters and my grandchildren away. I didn't even get to say goodbye or anything. And yeah, that's because you're a thief. That's why. But he didn't tell him that because he wasn't from Jersey. <laughs> but he ends up getting away, and now he's on his way home. And you understand going home sometimes is an interesting thing. Like, I don't know if you celebrate Christmases together or Thanksgivings together, but whenever the family gets together, not all families are healthy. Or you have to go to a wedding, and there's all the politics of who's showing up and where you're sitting. None of you people have this issue, I'm sure. But, or a funeral, and you're going to see somebody who you haven't seen in a long time, and you realize that there are loose ends with your relationship. Well, Jacob's about to do that. He's about to go and meet his brother because he's going home. The Lord called him to go home. I want you to go back to Bethel where I met you. If you remember, that's his first experience and encounter with God was at Bethel. And he called it the house of God. And he says, God was in this place and I didn't know it. He has this sort of born again experience where God comes and meets with them. And I hope every one of you have had that experience. And so he's on his way back and he sends a messenger and wants to find out how his brother's doing because his brother threatened to kill him and that's why he ran away. And so now he's going to go and face his brother Esau again, a man of the flesh, a man of the field. We're not sure exactly how he's going to react unless you read ahead, of course. <laughs> and so last week we talked about what it is to deal with your past because Jacob has run away from his past, run away from his problems, but now he's running headlong into them because he's running away from a worse problem, which is living with his father-in-law. And so he sends a messenger up, say, hey, how's everything doing? And uh, it turns out that the messenger comes back and tells him, yeah, things are great. Your brother's on his way here and he has 400 men. Uh-oh. I guess maybe he didn't get over the fact that I stole the blessing from him, even though he was dad's favorite. Now I got to go face him. And he's an angry man who's already threatened to kill him. I don't know if you've ever had anyone threaten to kill you. I mean, other than a teenager where they do that all the time. I hate you. Yeah, okay, whatever. Maybe you didn't have teenagers like that. Or have people say things in, in a fit of rage, I'm going to kill you. But now he's concerned because he sent the messenger out and he found out his brother's on his way with 400 men. Why would you come out with 400 men to greet your brother? Unless you were ready to slaughter him and anybody that happened to be with him. So that's what he's thinking. Because I don't think Esau had that many children. That would be great. It'd be great, 400 children. So we talked about fear. You know, that wave that comes over you when you realize that your life is in danger, when you're facing something you don't want to face, where you've been away from for some time, and now you're going to have an issue. Uh, any of you know what I'm talking about? That feeling that kind of swamps over you, and it's like a wave, and you can't think straight, and you're thinking a thousand things at once, and your imagination takes off, and you, know, you, you have this, uh, this evidence of appearing real, but you know that it's false evidence, because you're filling in the blank like a Mad Lib and just putting in whatever your imagination fills it in. So I imagine that's what Jacob's doing. He's wondering, he's coming here with 400 men. He's going to kill me. I, I'm dead. I'm dead. I'm dead. I'm dead. I'm dead. I'm dead. That's what he's thinking. And so he figures, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to pray. And he gets on his knees 
And he prays to God and he says, listen, you told me you were going to preserve me. You told me everything was going to be okay. You said that I should go back home. And so I'm, now I'm going back home and my brother's coming out here. Did you happen to escape this? Did you, did you notice that? Was this under your understanding? Did you not plan for that? Is this a surprise for you? You ever go to God like that? Feel like you're informing him of something that he's not aware of? God, do you see what's happening? Isn't that funny? I pray that way when I think about the Ukraine and Putin and mass shootings. and I'm like, hey, God, what are you doing? Why are you letting all this stuff go on? So he prays. And he's remembering something God spoke to him, which is important for us because we tend to forget things God speaks, right? Some of us write them down in journals and are able to look, them back, look back at them and remember them. Uh, other of us just try to remember as best as we can by constantly going over it in our minds. Testimonies are a good way that way, aren't they? For us to remember where it was and what God's taken us through. And so he prays and he confesses about his sin. And he asks God to examine his heart and put a check on all this stuff. And he petitions God. And he's thankful for everything that God's done in his life. It's uh, when you're about to lose everything, you're suddenly thankful for it, you know. Or just after you lose it. it tends to be that way. And so he goes to God in prayer. And he pours out his heart. And what he does is he has this really cool thing where he's sending out droves of animals ahead as a gift to his brother. And as they come up upon him, they're to say, hey, this is uh, all of these animals are yours because they're a gift from your brother. And there were successions of waves of shepherds bringing different animals to him. And he says, what are all these? Oh, these are all yours. It's a gift from your brother. There's another one. It's a gift from your brother. It's a bunch of donkeys. It's a gift from your brother. It's a whole bunch of camels. It's a gift from your brother. It's, it's like, you know, the 12 days of Christmas. And he's hoping by giving away all he has that he's going to appease his brother so his brother doesn't kill him. You think it was necessary? It's interesting. I wonder, was it necessary? Would that ever help anybody? If they're murderous toward you and you sent them a gift. It's never helped my wife, ever. <laughs> oh, I can't believe you. I have a gift for you. Oh, really? Oh, yeah, it just doesn't work that way. And so I just wonder if it's purposeful. I, I, certainly purposeful on Jacob's part, but I wonder if it was effectual. Anyway, I'm sorry. I, sometimes I just think out loud up here and talk to you. And of course, as he spends the night before he runs into his brother, he spends the night and he wrestles with first... It says a man. Then it says it was the angel of God. And then we find out that it's God himself that comes and wrestles with him. And he wrestles with God all night. You ever wrestle with God? Yes. All the time. And sometimes he even makes it look like you're winning. Because <laughs> he lets you go off and fail. He'll let you fall down. But then he'll be right there to pick you up when it's all over and say, okay, you done now? Or at least that's what I imagine. So he's wrestling and he wrestles all until daybreak. And he says, listen, you got to, the sun's rising. I got to go. And he says, I won't let you go until you bless me. Oh, that we had hearts like Jacob, that we would do that. That we would wrestle with God and cleave on to him and say, Lord, I'm not going to leave until you bless me. You think that's too forward? No. As we go to God? You know, it's the very thing that God honors when he does that. He says, I'm not letting you go until you bless me. Oh, that we could pray that way. Oh, that we could trust that God has the ability and the strength and the power to be able to do what we can only imagine. And so what he does as a blessing, and it didn't seem that way at the moment, is he touches his hip and it blows out a socket. And it stays that way for the rest of his life. And he walks with a limp from then on because he had an encounter with God and he wrestled with God all night. What that did was help to empty him of himself and be dependent. 
He would lean on a staff all the days of his life from then on. And he would have to lean on the Lord as well. Because he's not ready to fight his brother. He's not ready to give enough gifts and he's not ready enough to put his family in the forefront in case, you know, Esau's got a sword out that they all die first. That was his plan before the Lord wrestled with him. And so he seeks this blessing from God. When he was seeking the blessing from his father before and he had to steal it, here he has it for the asking. And so do we. We have it for the asking without having to be deceitful or tell God how good we've been. I've been a good boy, Lord. Can't I have a Maserati now? <laughs> we tend to work that way in our minds and it doesn't work that way at all. God gives us things for our benefit. And so he seeks this blessing and from then on he walks with a limp. And if you have had an encounter with God, if you've ever had to wrestle through some real serious stuff, I bet you bear the marks of it. I bet you bear a scar from it. I bet you bear a lesson from it. I would hope you do, unless you've forgotten or you pretend it wasn't that important. So this week, he's coming. He's coming. His brother is coming. It says, Jacob lifted up his eyes and he looked and behold, Esau was coming. And with him were 400 men. So he divided the children among Leah and Rachel and the two handmaids, and he put the maidservants and their children in front, Leah and her children behind, and Rachel and Joseph last. Wow, that's great. <laughs> now, I want you to notice that the maidservants aren't called his wives here. They're called his maidservants. It's interesting. So they apparently of lesser value have been put at the front. It's a fleshly move right here, guys. Okay? He's not a hero for doing this. But you know what? It shows his priorities, doesn't it? It shows his priorities. It's interesting. I can tell what your priorities are. All I have to do is ask you a few questions. What's your passion? Where do you spend your time? Where do you spend your money? Where do you spend your energy? That's going to be what's important to you. My car has an inspection sticker that as of midnight will expire. You know why? Because I'm standing here talking to you people. That's why. <laughs> I pushed it to the edge. It was too far. I should have went last week. But apparently it's not a priority, is it? You can tell the priorities in your life by what you do with your time, your treasures, and your talents. What do you do with those things? And apparently, this is a, a real flesh move. Now, here's, here's a way of studying the Bible. This is a, suddenly a Bible course right now. You can ask questions of the text when you read it. Like, what is he doing? Why did he rank them like that? Why did he put them in the forefront? Uh, were they the most attractive? Did he think he was going to, you know, what... What's he thinking? You, you have to ask questions of the text or you'll never get to the root of a, a lot of it, right? What do you think he's feeling? If you were Jacob, what would you be feeling? And so what's he do? He ranks his women and his children and put them in priority level to which ones he thinks he could lose first. What a fleshly move, right? It's a fleshly move. Have you ever seen men push their wives to the front to deal with things? Oh, I hit somebody. <laughs> Go to the store and you got to return something. I hate to return things. It'll sit in the back of my car until after I get my inspection. <laughs> I hate to return things because it means I'm an idiot as far as I'm concerned. You ordered this thing, you didn't need it, it didn't fit, it was the wrong size, you made a bad choice, eh, wrong. I feel like a failure every time I return something. How about you? Any men? Big pride? No, nobody's going to confess. Only Randy. Thank you, brother. I feel good. I feel good. I got a whole pile of them in the back of my car, and I'm sure they're expired, and I don't know where the receipts are. They probably faded away into the dust rack. What is Jacob feeling? 
He's feeling so much so that he doesn't want to get hurt that he's pushing his wives and kids in front of him. Men, bad move. Don't do this. Don't do this. Step up and step up and take it, right? So, what's he going to say? When you ever have one of these conflicts, you know, like if you have a job interview, you go through in your mind what you're going to say, right? But if he asks this, then I'm going to going to say this over here. Don't you rehearse things in your mind when it's a big traumatic thing? And usually uh, that's helpful, but in this situation, it's not going to do a darn thing for his brother's heart. His heart's going to be what his heart is. And then the question is, what's what's Esau going to do? Well, last we saw them, he said, I'm going to kill him. But he only said he was going to kill him after his father died. So He doesn't even know if his father's alive. So maybe he's got an out. Maybe there's a loophole in this agreement. So I'm sure that's what he's, he's going through all of these thoughts, even as you and I do, as we face very difficult situations. In the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter seven, verse 14, it says, in the day of prosperity, be joyful. But in the day of adversity, consider, surely God has appointed the one as well as the other so that man cannot find out nothing after him. Understand that if if you're going through a good time, and, you know, that's usually when we thank God, you know, blessed be your name, you know, when, when everything is going well. And then blessed be your name on the road marked with suffering. Though there's pain in the offering, blessed be your name. Understand that God has not run away, disappeared, or he's in the bathroom, or he's busy on a phone call, when you're going through hard times. He has either caused it to be for a very specific reason, or he has allowed it to happen for a very specific reason. That's the kind of God we serve. So when things are well, you can be joyful, and so you should. But in the day of adversity, consider this. God has allowed, caused, those things to happen. And yet, it's our privilege to figure out why? And it's the people that ask the why questions and the what questions and the who questions and the how come questions that actually get answers because we have a God who gives answers. Amen? Amen. So don't be afraid to ask him. I just figured I'd tell you that. (laughs) And so then he crossed over before them and bowed himself to the crown seven times until he came to his brother. He finally mans up. He pushes the ladies aside and the kids aside, and he goes, i got to face him. I've got to do it. And he pushes himself to the front, which is what he should have done, right? I imagine the Lord went, ding, what are you doing? You ever get that? When you do something, you plan on something, and then the Lord goes, ding, what are you doing? And you go, oh, yeah, this is totally wrong. I'm completely off. I'm really overtaken by my fear. I better cut this out. And he... He gets to the front of the line and now he's headed towards his brother and his brother's coming towards him and he bows himself seven times. Uh, By the way, this is a bowing at the waist thing and he takes a couple steps, he bows, he takes a couple steps, takes a couple steps until the seventh time he gets to his brother and he collapses on his knees and he bows before his brother. You know what I call that? A displayed humility. Here's a guy without any words is apologizing. You know, you can apologize apologize with your body language. You can apologize with your eyes. You can apologize with your hands. You can apologize with your attitude, with your tone. You know, most of our communication is done with that and not the content of what we say. How many of you are married? 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 Married. Okay. So you know the difference between listening to what somebody said and what they meant. (laughs) Or at least you've been told you should listen to what I meant instead of what I said. Yeah, but you said this. And that's always an argument, isn't it? Don't you people aren't normal, man. I mean, I have arguments with my wife about, no, this is what you said. And she goes, that's not what I meant. (laughs) How am I supposed to know? (laughs) You said this. Do you wish to amend? I, you, you don't want to argue with me when I'm in the flesh. It's a horrible thing. But praise God, 
he finally mans up and he's going to step forward. He's going to step forward. He's going to take responsibility. He's going to face him. And as he approaches him, he shows humility. And there's all the apology that you would ever want in his body language and his approaching in the seven bows. Everything he's doing is showing humility and he's apologizing for what he did. And so finally, he gets up to his brother. But Esau ran to meet him and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him and they wept. And he lifted his eyes and saw the women and children and said, who are these with you? So he said, the children whom God has graciously given your servant. And then the maid servants came near, they and their children, and they bowed down. And Leah also came near with her children, and they bowed down. And afterward, Joseph and Rachel came near, and they bowed down. So in succession, in order, they came before Uncle Laban, or Uncle, uh, sorry, Uncle Esau. So they, he's, he's getting to meet all these nephews and niece of his. Isn't that interesting? Meeting a relative you've never met. Have you ever experienced that? That's always fun because it's like, it's like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. So he, he goes up to him and he hugs him and he kisses him. It's the best thing that you could possibly think two people who have been estranged for 20 years under the threat of murder could possibly reunite. And they're reunited just instantly, just like that. You ever, ever see somebody you haven't seen for the longest time and it's like you guys never left each other? I imagine it's something like that. But all the past is forgotten. Apparently God's done a work in Esau's heart. Not just in Jacob's life and teaching him not to be a schemer, but also in Esau's heart because he's not holding bitterness anymore. And boy, isn't it nice to know that people aren't holding bitterness because dealing with that is a mess. And for him, it would have been the risk of his life. And then he goes, who are all these people? And he says, they're my people. He didn't say, these are my wives and these are my children. He says, these are those whom the Lord has graciously given me. Isn't that wonderful? Oh, that every husband and every wife would view their mate as the person whom God has given to them and blessed them with. That you would look at your children, not like, these are my children. These are the children whom God has graciously blessed me with. And he's giving glory to God for the things that he has. You know, you say, well, you know, I picked up a few women along the way. <laughs> Got kids with all of them. Good looking boys, aren't they? They're all boys except for the one girl, you know. And back then, that wasn't such a great thing. The people whom God has graciously given me. And he meets them, and they bow down as well. And Esau said, what do you mean by all this company in which I met? And he said, these are to find favor in the sight of my Lord. Curious comment. But Esau said, I have enough, my brother. Keep what you have for yourself. And Jacob said, no, please. If I have now found favor in your sight, then receive my present from my hand. And as much as I have seen your face, as though I have seen the face of God. Wait a minute, he just saw the face of God, didn't he? And he named the place, I've seen the face of God and lived. And you were pleased with me. Please take my blessing that is brought to you because God has dealt graciously with me and because I have enough. So he urged him and he took it. Isn't it interesting? He sends all these animals to appease his brother so his brother would not kill him so that he would find favor in his eyes to put it in a biblical fashion. And he says, I've got enough. Look, you see these 400 people? They're my personal bodyguard. I've got enough. I've been living home with dad and, you know, raking it in. I've been doing well while you're out there being ripped off, being taught by God not to be a deceiver. I got enough. Isn't it nice when somebody has enough? Isn't it nice, nice to know that you have enough? Contentment, godliness and contentment, there's great gain. 
And so he says, I want you to take my gift. And he goes, no, 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 I got enough. And he goes, no, really, really. And he goes, okay. So what do you make of that? Well, I make a couple of things. I make a hat, a scarf. <laughs> what is the difference between a gift and a bribe? Because the Bible talks about gifts being good. Bribes are bad. Gifts are good. Bribes are bad. Gifts, bribes. What was this? Hmm. What's the difference between you giving a gift at Christmas to somebody that you know is going to get you a gift for Christmas because they got you one last year and you didn't get them one? Is that a gift or a bribe? Hmm. You know, you need to look into your heart and check your motive because that's the only difference, really. The only difference between giving a gift and giving a bribe is motive. What's your motive? Are you hoping something to come out of this to your advantage? Or are you giving it because it's free? And you're just giving it as an expression of your love and care for somebody. That's a gift. A bribe is when you're looking for something in return, right? Like if I bring home chocolates on Mother's Day and flowers, and a meal out, and a dress, and new shoes. What do you think I'm getting out of that? Maybe a thank you, right? What are you expecting out of it? And oh, by the way, on Mother's Day, we won't have the usual spread here because all of those people are mothers who prepare all that. And they'll be going out because it is the biggest going out to eat holiday in America. Just so you know. I'm going to just spice this up by throwing announcements in. I just thought I'd let you know. <laughs> the difference between a gift and a bribe is your motive. What is your motive? Are you looking to get something out of it or is it free? Receiving a gift is as important as giving. Think about it. In, in the Eastern culture, when you give a gift like that, you would never give it to an enemy, ever. You would never give a gift to an enemy. It would always be somebody you cared about, deeply cared about, or really needed on your team, uh, apparently in this case. But to not receive it is an insult. Although, I don't know about you guys, but like we go out, we in this church, we'll go out to eat somewhere with, with folks, and it's, it's always, you know, Who's going to grab the check when it comes to the table? And you got to be really slick because John Colbeth's very quick. And you have to sometimes get deceitful and say, listen, I have to go to the bathroom. And you go to the bathroom and you talk to the waitress. You say, make sure I get the check, okay? Because we like to give, don't we? But sometimes it's really hard to receive. I don't know about you, I don't, like, I don't like the receiving thing. I'm much more comfortable paying for somebody I just took out to eat instead of uh, letting them pay for me. Because then I feel, I wasn't anticipating this. But you know, receiving the gift is almost as important as giving the gift, isn't it? Because when somebody is a good receiver, when they have a thankful heart for what's been given and they understand it's a deepening of our relationship and it's an expression of your love towards me and I receive that and I return that, you return by receiving. As hard as that might be for some of you to understand, for somebody to receive a gift that you give, like, you know, the ugly sweater that Aunt Edna got you. And you go, thanks. Where's the love? You know, you got to look at it and you have to put it on immediately. It doesn't matter how warm you are. You got to put it on. Because receiving the gift is sometimes as important as the giving of a gift. Amen? So we figure that out anyway. You know what it is? This is a, this is a short chapter, so I'm going on too long. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7, we're given an instruction here. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity. In other words, duty. You know, oh, it's Christmas. I got to send them a card because they're going to send me one. For God loves a cheerful 
giver. So giving is something that we do as an expression of our love, and it's supposed to be free, and it's not supposed to be grudging, like, here you go, you know. Have you ever, you ever had that happen? You ever had, like, an annoying person to come up and say, oh, oh, sorry, I understand that. Your, your kids are getting married, huh? Uh-huh. Well, did you send out the invitations yet? Yeah, they're all out. They're almost all returned. Oh, because I didn't get mine. It's because I didn't send you one. If you're being honest. Are you going to give them one and say, oh, I must have got lost in the mail. Or you're going to make, come on, just, anyway. So you give it grudgingly, right? The Bible says don't do that. Purpose in your heart what the Lord would have you do and say, listen, sorry, you were right at that cutoff line. <laughs> Apparently, you guys don't go through the same things I do because <laughs> I go through stuff like this. Anyway, so he gives the gift. It's received by Esau, their, their buddies, right? Then Esau said, let us take our journey. Now he's starting to use these key these words, our journey. Let us take our journey. Let us go and I will go before you. Oh, that's very kind of you. Kind of. But Jacob said to him, my Lord knows that the children are weak, that the flocks and the herds which are nursing are with me. And if the men should drive them hard one day, all the flock will die. That's it, probably a bit of an exaggeration. Please let my Lord go on ahead before his servant and I will lead on slowly at the pace which the livestock that go before me and the children are able to endure until I come to my Lord at Seir. Seir is a mountain range, by the way, where Esau has made his home and where he is going. It's interesting. Esau's going to Seir. Where's Jacob going? He wasn't really going to meet his brother. That just happened. He was going home and he was going to Bethel, actually, where the house of God is. Because God told him, make sure you go back to Bethel where I spoke to you. It's always a good idea to go back where the Lord last spoke to you. So by the way, this is Mount Seir. And you can see all of the etch etchings and carvings and um, there's, there's some interesting things. If you ever watch Indiana Jones, you'll see a carved city in the rock and it's actually uh, very near this place. So this is Mount Seir and this is where the Edomites live, um, Esau's descendants. And so he says, follow me. Uh, no. <laughs> Why doesn't Jacob want to follow him to Seir? It's a good question, right? Why wouldn't you want to follow someone like Esau to the place of where he lives? Well, because the Lord told me to go somewhere else. The Lord didn't tell me to go home with you, right? Which is a good reason not to go home with somebody. The Lord didn't tell me to go home with you, right? So he says, follow me. Let us go on, on our journey. We're going to my house with all my 400 men. And he goes, you guys will drive us crazy. You'll drive us too hard. All the flocks will just drop dead in one day. Plus I have the children. So why don't you go on ahead? I'll meet you. Have you ever had somebody say that? I'll meet you. No, you go ahead. I'm okay. What's he trying to do? He's trying to scrape his brother off his shoe. Yeah, because he doesn't want to follow this guy. Why? Because he's a man of the flesh. You too shouldn't go where your flesh takes you. You too shouldn't make these allegiances with those who don't know the Lord Jesus Christ. He doesn't have a relationship with God. Esau is a man of the flesh. And you know, when you're with somebody that you've had trouble in the past, it's nice to have peace, but you don't want to push it. Right? Don't you have people that you walk on eggshells around because, you know, we're on a good footing right now. Let's kind of keep it that way. I don't want to say anything to upset you and I don't want to go, I don't want to see you in a murderous mood again. So it's a pretty wise thing that he wants to pull away. Number one, because the Lord told him to go somewhere else. Number two, because Esau really should not be trusted. I've known people to go into business together, a believer and a non-believer. Guess what happened? It didn't work out. And guess who got burned? 
the believer, because the unbeliever doesn't care. They don't serve the Lord, but the one who does serve the Lord, they're the ones that get beat up. So don't do that. The scripture says don't be unequally yoked, because what does, what does God have to do with Baal? Nothing. Be careful of those allegiances. And I think Jacob's doing a wise thing by getting away from his brother, although I'm not sure he's telling the entire truth. He's trying to get out of this thing. And by the way, this is where they're going. He's coming from up in this area, and his brother's going to Mount Seir, which is down here in Eden. Bethel is up in here, okay? Just so that you get an idea of the geography. So Esau's going south west. As soon as Esau makes a little distance, Jacob is going northeast. He's going to go in the total opposite direction. I'm sorry, did I ruin it for you? So Esau said again, now let me leave you with some of the people who are with me. He means the 400 men. But he said, what need is there? Let me find favor in the sight of my Lord. So Esau returned that day on his way to Seir. So he says, oh, you're going to meet me, huh? Okay. Well, I'm going to leave some of my men with you just kind of as an escort, you know, to protect you, you know, to lead you on. So you get to Seir. Completely unnecessary. We're good. I'm good. Just please go. And he does. And he goes. He gets about three days journey and Jacob turns northeast. He goes southwest. He's going northeast. Get the idea he's trying to get away from him? It's probably not such an unrighteous move. So they say goodbye and they go their separate ways. Although Esau's probably wondering after a few days, hey, where is he? I thought he was going to meet me here. What's going on? So, and Jacob journeyed to Sukkoth, which is northeast, built himself a house and made booths for his livestock. Therefore, the name of the place is called Sukkoth, which means booths. And then Jacob came safely to the city of Shechem, which is in the land of Canaan. And when he came from Padam Aram, and he pitched his tent before the city, and he, brought, he bought a parcel of land that he had pitched his tent from the land of Hamor, from the children of Hamor, Shechem's father, 100, and piece, 100 pieces of money. And then he erected an altar there, and he called it El Elohi Israel, which means God, the God of Israel. Interesting. I can understand him going in the opposite direction. But I have a problem with a couple of things. God told Abraham and Isaac and Jacob that God would make them wanderers and that they would always be in tents and never settle down until they come into Canaan, into the promised land. And the Lord told him previously that he should go to Bethel. In fact, it's here in Genesis 31. I am the God of Bethel, where you anointed a pillar and where you made a vow to me. Now arise, get out of this land and return to the land of your family. He didn't say go with Esau. He wants him in Bethel. And he eventually gets there. But he's taking a really large detour. He's gone northeast when he really should have gone southwest and a little bit more west than the Edomites would be. So what's he doing? And he builds a house. Wait, he's supposed to dwell in tents. Why is he building a house? That's permanence, isn't it? You build a house, you're not, you know, you can't just up and move the house. It's made of stone, right? So what's he doing? He's getting sidetracked. Have you ever known that God's told you to do something and get sidetracked? It's easy to do. I've done it. I had, I had an opportunity to buy a 9,000 square foot house in Pennsylvania and I made it my home. It was an old church. We bought it cheap and then dumped a bunch of money into it. 9,000 square feet. You know what it'd be worth out here? But I got it cheap and I put my back into it and fixed everything. It was beautiful. 
I had a 23-foot ceiling in my living room. We used to play volleyball there before I, picked, before I fixed it up. It was 43 feet by 42 feet with a 23-foot ceiling and no beams. It's a perfect volleyball court. What I was doing there was building a kingdom here on earth. And the Lord told me that I should leave that and come back to New Jersey. What? That was my Shechem. That was the place where I was going to go and settle down and, you know, I'm not going to be on the move anymore and I'm going to have a place of my own. I've been through this. It took me over a year to put the roof on. On a 12-12 pitch. Anyway, he's been sidetracked. He's gone to Shechem. And next week, you're going to see it costs him dearly because of this little sidetrack. Being in a place where you shouldn't be. Being in a place where God didn't call you to be has consequences. We're going to see that next week. So this is Shechem. It's actually a very famous place. And you're going to see the king of Shechem, whose name is Shechem. This is where Jacob's well is. This is where Joseph's tomb is, where Joseph eventually gets buried. His bones end up coming back from Egypt. It's where Mount Gerizim and Mount Ebal are. And if you remember your history, you remember the blessings and cursings on each of those mountains. So this is in that, in that region. Um, I like to take a trip every once in a while to the land of Israel with you via pictures. So there it is. And it's interesting because when he was there, he set up a Altar, because that's everywhere he goes, he gets altered, right? That's a good thing. Except he's in a place where God really didn't want him to be. He's on a side, side mission. He's not on mission where God's called him to be. I remember the words in 1 Samuel 15, 22. And Samuel has said, Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed than the fat of rams. Being obedient to God is more important than any gift you'll ever give him. If you want to give him a gift, give him the gift of obedience. Something he's called you to do. More than sacrifice, more than, I sat through a church service. <laughs> you don't know what that means, Lord. I had to stay awake and pay attention and smile. Listen, it's better to be obedient and do what the Lord would have you do than any kind of sacrifice that you might give. It's better to do that. So, by the way, this is the rock in Shechem. You can see it's not really the greenest neighborhood, but they believe that this altar is actually the altar in which got set up. And he has a habit of not just building stones together, but raising up a stone as a pillar and makes this. So that's why that is... It's uh, interesting. It's got graffiti on it. It seems to be somewhat neglected. It's not like a historical site with fences around it and a, and a big dome. Kind of sad. But here's a place where he called on the Lord, but it's not really in the place where the Lord wants him to be. Yeah, but Lord, look, look at all the things I could do for you. Look at all the money I'll make if I take this job. Anyway, next week, we're going to look at the taking of Dinah. Dinah, the only daughter of Leah, the only daughter of Jacob. Because they're in a place where they shouldn't be, there are things that happen that shouldn't happen. Because they've been exposed to this secular world in a place where they're not supposed to be. And although he got away from his brother without getting killed, they're now soaking like Lot was in a world that is completely alien to having a relationship with God. So we'll look at the taking of Dinah next week and all of the repercussions of that. Today.